today is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. So Evaluate advances evaluation in the ATE community, and we do this by offering trainings such as this one, cultivating a network of people who are interested in value evaluation. We research emerging topics within evaluation, and we collect data about the ATE program through the ATE survey. So I said this earlier, but just so you know, you can download all of the slides from today, as well as the resource that handout that has a lot of links to things that we're gonna talk about and things that I hope you find helpful. And this webinar will be recorded uh, today and it'll be available within a couple days and I will email that directly to you. So you should have that before next week. So my name is Lissa wilson Becho, and I am the Principal Investigator for Evaluate. Evaluate is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. I wanna take a minute to recognize my colleagues who have worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today, including my amazing Evaluate team and Carolyn williams Noran, Evaluate's editor. I also want to thank everyone at Force AT and Mentor Up for coordinating this time for us today. I really appreciate being able to talk with you all. And finally, I want to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect that of the National Science Foundation. So without further delay, let's dive into the content and get started. So like I said, I am so excited to be here with you all today to talk about evaluation. So we're going to try and pack a lot into the next hour, hour 15 minutes or so. So today's webinar is broken up into three sections. What is evaluation? Why should you do it? And finally, logistics, things like budgeting, selecting an evaluator, and how to integrate it into your proposal. So make sure that you stay tuned and are ready to jump in because we have a lot of interactivity as well as question breaks built in throughout the webinar. I will keep an eye on the chat box throughout today's webinar. So if a question pops into your mind, go ahead and put it in the chat box. Um, I may save it till one of our question breaks, but if it fits in, I will just integrate that answer into uh, the section that we're at. So to start off, I want to get our brains thinking about evaluation. So I want to do a quick warm up activity. So when you hear the word evaluation, what is the first thing that comes to mind? What's one word that comes to mind? So you can put your response in the chat box that should show up on the right side of your screen. So Beth said assessment, Barbara said measurement. Yes, I think those words frequently come up when we talk about evaluation. Criteria, that's a really good one, Amy, I love that. What other words? These are synonyms, but I also, sometimes people have emotional reactions to the word evaluation. So tools, assessment, Neve says. How do you feel when you hear evaluation? Analysis, cross-check with criteria, clarity, program improvement, I love that one. I love all of those. All right, and one more question to get you started. So I actually gotta go into the polls tab. I'm gonna launch this poll. So how would you describe your familiarity with evaluation? Would you say you have no idea what it is or where to start? Maybe you've heard of it before, but need some pointers, or maybe you're very familiar and you're just joining us today to strengthen your understanding on the basics. So you can respond to this poll question on the right side of your screen under the polls tab. So it looks like we have a pretty good split. A lot of people are really familiar with it. Some people have heard of it before, but need some pointers. All right. Well, regardless of how much you, uh, where you're coming from or how much experience you've had with evaluation already, I really hope that you come away from today's webinar having learned something or think about something in a new light. Um, so. I, I think we'll make sure to take full advantage of those question answer discussion sections to make sure that we are pushing everyone's understanding um, and questions around evaluation. So to start off, I want to introduce Jen Generickson. So Jen is gonna help us work through some of the basics of evaluation so that you'll all leave this webinar feeling confident about building evaluation into your projects. So Jen, she has a great idea for an ATE project. Jen's college has noticed a drop in students' attendance and engagement in their technical programs. This has dramatically increased over the past year with virtual learning due to COVID. And 
They are, they're going to implement intrusive advising to reach students and train advisors on how to use this approach to make sure that no student falls through the cracks of academia. The college is also seeing a lot of dropouts among first generation students. So they will use grant funds to develop resource materials and strategies to support these students and help them succeed regardless of the types of barriers they face in completing their education. Finally, they are also going to create a new tech prep course which helps students in technical programs develop in the areas of critical thinking, teamwork skills, and resilience. So they expect, oops, sorry. So they expect these activities to lead to an increase in the number of students completing technical degrees and transferring to four-year STEM programs. So Jen and her team feel like they have a pretty good plan that meets the real need of their college. So she's reading over the ATE program solicitation before she starts writing her proposal and she comes to this section on evaluation. So this section in the solicitation states that all projects carry out evaluation activities. So she, Jen has never had an NSF grant and she's not entirely sure what they mean by evaluation activities. In fact, she has a lot of questions like, uh, what do they even mean by evaluation? This project doesn't have a big budget. So how much is this evaluation activity gonna cost? Why should I have to do it? Who does the evaluation? Where does it go within my grant proposal? And what will happen after I get funded? How does the evaluation actually affect my project? So you might have these questions too. And in this webinar, we're gonna walk through each of these questions and help Jen, hopefully you wrap your head around evaluation. So let's start off with the most fundamental question of what is evaluation? Well, if we look up the word in the dictionary, we find a definition eight definition like this. So evaluation is the determination of value, nature, character, or quality of something or someone. Well, okay, but that doesn't exactly tell a whole lot about what funders mean by program evaluation. So there's an old story about a group of blindfolded people around an elephant. They all can't, they can't see the whole elephant as individuals. They can only feel different parts of it. So each person is pretty certain they know what it is based on the part of it that they're experiencing, the part of the elephant they're experiencing. And we found that evaluation can be a lot like that. So when I tell people that I work at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University, they'll often say, oh, you do the course evaluations or you do surveys or like some of you said before, assessment or measurement, um, or is that something like auditing? So while each of these are related to the evaluation process, none of them really gives you the whole picture of what evaluation is. So boiled down, evaluation involves four main steps. The first one involves asking important questions about a project's process, outcomes, or other dimensions. So this is about making sure that the evaluation focuses on the things that really matter. The next step is gathering evidence that will help answer those questions. Then we have to make sense of those data so that we interpret the results and answer the evaluation questions. And then the last step is to use the information for accountability, improvement, and planning. But that's not really the final step because the evaluation should inform decisions about the next project step, making this a cyclical process. So let's take a closer look at what might be included in each of these steps. So for the first one, important questions might ask whether goals were achieved, but they could also focus on things like project implementation, measuring outcomes like changes in target population, or even look at the sustainability of the project. In the elephant cartoon from earlier, one person equated evaluation with research. And yes, evidence for evaluation is often gathered using research methods like things like focus groups, interviews, surveys, or even experimental designs. In the ATE program, evaluations often utilize a college's institutional data. They may use resort results from course evaluations and sometimes even include feedback from panels of experts or advisors. So when it comes to interpreting or making meaning of that data that was collected, evaluators almost always look for project strengths and weaknesses. In assessing outcomes, we should determine the magnitude or extent of the outcomes and their practical significance for the people involved. So this is often done by comparing to some sort of benchmark or standard. And evaluation results uh, can be used to make project improvements as 
as the project is being implemented and new plans are being created. So results can be included to funders and it'll help uh, when seeking new funding as evidence of your capacities. Lessons learned from evaluations can also contribute to a discipline's larger knowledge base about the effectiveness of different types of interventions. So I wanna pause there, because I think that was a lot of information at once. So let's just stop here for a moment and check in with yourself. So in the chat window, how are you feeling? You feel like you got this? This is easy peasy? You feel a little overwhelmed? Feel like you're getting there? Amy feels great. I love it. I see there's a comment in there about uh, from Elizabeth about thinking about not just about accountability, but also about what differences it makes. So yeah, we're gonna talk about the purposes of evaluation in a minute, and it's not just accountability. For me, I think the most important part is that improvement piece. Okay, so it seems like everyone's doing okay. All right, so let's move forward. So let's go back to Jen for a second. So now Jen has this introduction of these four major steps in evaluation. And ideally, she will have an evaluator on board before she submits her project to, to help her develop a plan for all these four steps. But the most important step for Jen and for other non-evaluators on her project is to determine what questions are the most important to her project and team. So it's really best to start thinking about these evaluation questions really early in the project planning stage. So to do this, she'll want to map out the activities she and her team are planning and how these activities are gonna bring about the change that she wants to see for students at her college. So a good way to do this is to develop a logic model. The ATE program doesn't require logic models, but a lot of people find them really useful for thinking through what the project is gonna do and also for communicating that plan to others, both internally with your team as well to the reviewers of your proposal. So this webinar isn't uh, really about the details of building a logic model, but I do want to go ahead and create Jen's logic model with you. And we have some resources to share with you later about how you can do this for your own project. But for now, as I build this logic model, I'd like you to start thinking about what questions you think the evaluation should ask. So first, let's go ahead and plug in those activities that we know are part of the project's activities in the leftmost column. So then we'll go ahead and put the outcomes that the project is supposed to achieve, which are to increase the number of students, graduate student number of graduates who either transfer to STEM programs at four-year colleges or who enter the technical workforce. So now we need to connect the activities to those desired long-term outcomes. So it's expected that these activities will lead to more students passing technical courses and staying enrolled at a college. And then if those short-term outcomes are achieved, the college will see more students persisting in their technical programs and graduating with marketable technical credentials, which they can use to either transfer to four-year STEM programs or enter the workforce. So now that you see this project mapped out on a logic model, what types of evaluation questions do you think Jen and her evaluation team should ask in their evaluation? So you can use the chat box to the right side of your screen to share your ideas. So if you are designing an evaluation for this program, what kind of questions do you think they should ask? So it might be helpful to think about what Jen might want to know to impress NSF or her college administrators. Or would you focus more on the implementation of the activities, the achievements of the short-term outcomes? Yeah, so Beth wrote, how can we improve graduation rates? And so because this is an evaluation of whether or not these activities are improving graduation rates, I might change that to say, to what extent are graduation rates increasing? Emily asked, how many students will persist? Yes, persistence is a really good and Craig asked, why are students dropping away? Right, so I think focusing on how those questions differ, like is this happening? To what extent is this happening? And then Craig's question is more, why is this happening? And I think evaluation can answer both. What is happening, but also what are the mechanisms behind that? And Barbara says, what was the impact of intrusive advising? Yeah. 
So I think things that are coming out of this is like some of them are process questions, some of them are outcome questions. These are all really good. So now that Jen has some good ideas of what question her evaluation will address, she and her evaluator will need to consider how they gather the data to answer those questions. So we typically aim for using a mix of quantitative and qualitative data from multiple sources to address questions. Numbers and stories together tend to tell a fuller picture of the project, that what is happening and how or why is it happening. It also makes a more convincing argument to stakeholders. So once Jen's evaluators have collected the data, they need to plan for interpreting that data. So numbers and quotes alone are not always meaningful to the project or to its context. So this interpretation is an important step in the evaluation process. And then after the data is interpreted into meaningful information, evaluation findings can be integrated into a written or oral report that's shared back with project staff and others. So here is where Jen and her team will really need to consider how her project might need to react to or change their project activities based on the evaluation findings. Or perhaps she is ready to think about her next project. So to make sure that the project is on track, to make sure the project is on track, to make a difference for students, the question that I would focus on in the project's design and implementation, I'd ask to what extent are the virtual tech program courses, the first generation student resources and intrusive advising meeting meetings, meet, I'm sorry, to what extent are the, these activities meeting the needs of the students, right? So do the students need this? Is there something else that they, they want help with and it's just not serving them? Then I'd move to the next level of outcomes. So I'd want to determine the extent to which the project is impacting student success in technical courses. So that's question number two here about um, the success, success in technical courses, and then their ability to navigate college and stayed enrolled, which is question number three. I think you guys brought up both of those questions as well. So next I'd suggest looking at how the project is impacting student persistence in technical programs. So question number four here on the screen and program completion rates, which is question number five. So I would actually not suggest an evaluation for the long-term outcome given the short duration of the project. ATE projects are typically three years in length and it can just be difficult for an evaluation to measure items like change in graduation rates in that span of time, especially if you have to get a new program up and running and students through the course. So this is what the whole set of questions would kind of look like. We'd have these five overarching evaluation questions, which address both process questions as well as outcomes. And we would aim for a mix of quantitative and qualitative data from multiple sources to address all the questions. So this webinar doesn't get into the details of data collection, but I do want to say that on the handout for you, we have a lot of additional resources around creating logic models, um, as well as creating a, um, evaluation questions on that evaluation question checklist. So again, that handout is available for you to download in the handouts section on the right side of your screen. So now Jen has a better sense of what it means to have her project evaluated, but it's actually more involved than she had imagined. So now she's concerned about how much it will cost, but we'll get to that in a second. I'm gonna take a pause right here to see if there are any questions. So does anyone have any questions about what evaluation is? Uh, let's see, I can either, you can either ask your question um, here, let me, or I just invited you to this stage. So you'll just have to give your computer screen access and say, yes, I agree to go to the stage. And you should be able to access your microphone. So who, who should be involved in developing evaluation questions? Yes. Ideally, that development of evaluation questions really is a collaboration between project staff and the evaluation team. So I think 
an evaluation team can come with some great ideas and some great strategies on making those questions and making them very evaluative. But at the end of the day, those questions should be driven by what the project team wants to know. Is there something really specific you want to know, whether it's working or not working? Is there a specific group of students or participants that you want to focus on? Um, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but there are a lot of confusing paths to getting an evaluator on your project. And so you may find yourself in a position where you have to write a proposal without being able to contract with an evaluator upfront. Um, so there might be some procurement restrictions within your institution about working with an evaluator before you're funded. And so in that situation, I think the project staff can be the primary drivers of those questions in the proposal stage, but certainly would suggest you revisit those evaluation questions once you are funded and you have that evaluator on board. So Barbara asked, do you have any guidelines on what qualifies for long term? Obviously, something in line the amount of time to change culture, student retention, but I'd like to hear more about it. Yes. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, you'll see those uh, headings on the logic model that say short term, midterm and long term outcomes. I think in general, those labels actually mean nothing. They're up to you to define. And so thinking through how long is your project? So like I said, most AT projects are rather short, right? We're talking three years. And I know a fair number of projects that spend the majority of that first year getting up and running. Um, and so the idea that by the end of year three, you have student graduation rates doesn't feel feasible to me. So of course, like how long is long term always depends on your context. So really sitting down and thinking through with your evaluation team, with your project team, how long would you expect? Like um, there's a process where you can kind of journey map what a student's interaction with your project would be and what you would expect that to look like. So you kind of make this journey of a student's path from coming in to taking courses to, to graduating to getting employed. And I think that that process will really help put some uh, timeline posts along the way to say what is feasible and what could you really measure within that amount of time. So Amy asks, the evaluator does not evaluate the proposal. So Amy, I would want you to expand on that a little bit more, but I let me say something and then we'll see if it answers your question. So the majority of the time I have seen project staff reach out to an evaluator, ask some questions, feel like it's a good fit, which we can talk more about. And then that evaluator could, can help create the evaluation plan for your proposal. So they are writing say one to two pages of that evaluation plan in consultation with you to make sure that it's meeting the needs of your project. And then that section gets put into your proposal. So I wouldn't say that they're evaluating the proposal in a sense. Um, the people who are really doing that critical evaluation, evaluation will be the NSF reviewers. Um, but I think that evaluators have played a really important role in reviewing proposals before they're submitted to NSF. Having that critical eye, having that critical friend who can come in as a third party to say, like this language isn't making sense to me or these pieces aren't matching up, um, I think is a really valuable resource and way to use your evaluation team. And most evaluators will be more than happy to do that. Please let me know if that didn't answer the question you had in mind. All right, so we will have more question breaks. Okay, here, let me. Oh, Amy, I thought I could invite you, but for some reason it's not giving me that option. I wonder if it's because you don't have a microphone hooked up. Hmm. Um, Emily said, don't evaluators continue once the proposal gets granted? Yes, so your evaluator will continue with your project through the duration of your project. And we have a timeline that we can look at in a few minutes as well. 
Barbara says, so having an ATE goal or something like increasing student retention by 20% is probably not a viable goal. Would you recommend sizing down goals to something achievable? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I will say increasing your student retention by 20% really depends on how many students are in that population, right? So uh, you have 10 students, 20% increase is only two students, and maybe that's feasible within your context. But really taking a look and saying, is this possible to happen within the scope of three years? I think your evaluator can help you reflect on those questions and help make sure that it's feasible. But something that I always say as an evaluator is that I bring the evaluation expertise and the project staff brings the project expertise, the content expertise. You know your college, you know your students, you know your workforce. And so making sure that you are bringing that expertise into the conversation to make sure that everything flows together. Amy also asked, when should we bring in an evaluator? Before we submit or at the beginning of a proposal? I think that you should bring in an evaluator as soon as you possibly can. And most evaluators that I've talked to will say the same exact thing, that they appreciate being involved in the very early stages because they can help do some of those things like logic model planning or creating evaluation questions or determining goals. Um, something that I will say, some colleges have restrictions about when you can bring an evaluator on. So some people have um, procurement restrictions that will say you can only have an evaluator join your team after you receive funding. So in that case, it would be after your proposal is funded. Um, but there are a lot of evaluators that will work with you uh, before that process without actually getting paid until you are funded. Blake uh, points out that in determining your goal, looking at baseline institutional data is a really good idea for when crafting your outcome statement. Yes, absolutely. And then Amy asked, how do they charge? Why don't we actually move on to the next section? Because we start to get into cost and then um, we have another question break as well. All right. So speaking of how much does it cost? How do they charge? Let's go into that. So here's an excerpt from the ATE program solicitation about the evaluation requirement. So it states that the evaluation budget must match the scope of the proposed evaluation activities. And that's really important, but not really satisfying for people who just want to get a figure into their budget so that they can work with. So the general rule of thumb is that 10% of a project's direct costs should be allocated to evaluation. And that's for evaluation in any context. So that's a good place to start. And then you can go up and down from there. So depending on what level of evaluation is needed for your project. So a variety of factors can really influence an evaluation's budget. So some examples of these factors might include, say, the types of questions your evaluation is asking. So evaluation questions that focus on process implementations may be less costly than questions that ask about long-term outcomes due to time or data needs and the type of data that you're using. Existing data may be less time consuming for the evaluation team compared to when they need to gather new data. So new data might be more expensive. Whether the data is quantitative or qualitative. So qualitative data tends to be more time intensive when it comes to collection, cleaning, and analysis. And therefore, evaluations that rely more heavily on qualitative data might be more expensive. Different evaluators interact with projects differently. So if you're looking for an evaluator who might be highly responsive to changes in your activities, timelines, or data needs, that might be more costly than a rigid or less responsive evaluation. And similarly, an evaluator who is more involved with meetings or decision making might be more costly just because of the time they're spending with your project. So evaluation efforts can be a shared external evaluation and internal evaluation efforts. So more assistance from an internal evaluation effort may reduce the burden on your external evaluator, making them less costly for the evaluation in the end. So things like travel time could also affect the evaluation budget. Um, I know this looks a bit different um, when we were in COVID and all virtual, but considering how far your evaluator might have to travel for meetings or site visits, obviously longer travel times will lead to a higher evaluation budget. 
So I want to share these things to say that this, this is not a perfect formula to write an evaluation budget, but just as some guideposts to understand how that 10% rule of thumb might be affected by the type of evaluation your project is looking for. So it's always best to have an open conversation with your evaluator about your needs and their needs. And the fact of the matter is, if evaluation is going to bring value to your project, you really have to fund it adequately. So there was a question, and I'll answer it here, about how do you pay them? And so there are a number of different mechanisms um, that evaluator could be written in as a consultant. Um, I have seen them written in as a subaward at some times. Um, but what it really comes down to is your institution's policy. So I would talk to your grants office or your um, research office on how they typically handle those. So I think everyone asked this question of, I would really rather use these funds to, for a service that has a direct impact on students. So why should I spend all this money on evaluation? Well, the quick answer is that it is required by NSF. It's a matter of compliance. But I do want to say that, like, let's take a step back and think why NSF would require evaluation. So there are really good reasons to have your project evaluated, even if it's not required. So in general, evaluation, we say three, serves these three main purposes for improvement, accountability, and evidence. So we'll walk through each of these, starting with improvement, because it's really the most important. So some like to say that the most important purpose of evaluation is not to prove, but to improve. Evaluation can help your project improve, be more impactful, be more efficient, Evaluation can really help answer the questions of what works for whom and why. So here's that logic model from Jen's project. So this is how her and her team expect the project to work. But the evaluation results may show that it doesn't actually work the way they thought it would, for better or for worse. Evaluation can provide insights on how to adjust the project's activities to really maximize those outcomes. So I want to share an example from a project that was funded through the NSF's new to ATE program. So this project was called Rebranding the 21st Century IT Technician, and the principal investigator was Asa Bradley at Spokane Community College. So she wrote a blog about her experience, which is linked to in that webinar handout. So her grant was aimed at increasing female enrollment and retention in her college's information systems program. The project included a day-long IT camp for incoming eighth and ninth grade young women. So in the original project plan, she had set aside money for five college students to help out uh, during the summer camp. And they ended up having more college students want to be involved than she expected. And those students, they brought more ideas, they brought leadership to the project, far more than was anticipated. So the project's evaluation included a survey of those college students. So even though those weren't the initial participants they thought that they were making a change on, that survey showed that nearly all of those college students believe that the camp experience increased their confidence as leaders and their ability to work in teams. So as Asa wrote in her blog, we are happy that we dedicated the work with an external evaluator, even though our grant was uh, is small, a small grant for institutions new to ATE. Because of the questions our evaluators asked, we have the data to justify moving resources around in our budget. So that's just one small example of how a project used its evaluation results for improvement. So now let's consider the purpose of accountability. So at the most basic level, evaluation enables a high degree of accountability. So individual grantees are held accountable for their use of federal resources and the information helps NSF be accountable to Congress and justify the continued support of the program. Projects funded by NSF have to submit annual reports through an online system called research.gov. So the main report sections are shown here in these little tabs. So in the accomplishment section, grantees report on their project's goals, activities, objectives, their results, and their outcomes. So evidence of project results and outcomes are gonna come uh, in large part from the evaluation. So this section is also where grantees upload their evaluation reports so that their NSF program officer can review it. If a project encounters problems or opportunities to shift the project's focus and maybe to more maximize their outcomes like ASA did, evidence of that substantiated change in their plans can be included in the section for changes or problems. 
And again, all of that can come from the evaluation findings. So in addition to providing evaluation results annually to NSF as an accountability function, NSF grantees also need evidence of project outcomes if they apply for another a grant from NSF in the future. So if Jen goes back to NSF in a few years to request funding for a new project, she'll have to begin her proposal with a section called results from prior NSF support. And in this section, it has to include evidence of specific outcomes and results, including metrics to demonstrate the impact of the project's activities. So let's take a minute to think about what would make a really compelling evidence of project impact. So here are three statements that could show up in a results of prior support section in the future proposal that Jen submits. So take your time to read these examples carefully and then I'm going to pop up a poll that will allow you to indicate which example, A, B, or C, do you think has the most compelling um, argument for reviewers as evidence of outcomes. So I'm going to launch that poll and stay quiet for a few seconds for you to read. So I'll give a few more seconds. As a reminder, we are looking at which of these examples would be the most compelling to reviewers as evidence of project outcomes. All right, it looks like we have about almost 90% of people answering. So let's go ahead and look at each of these examples more closely. So let's start with example A. So in example A, really only said what they were funded to do. So Celeste Carter, who is the ATE program lead, has said that this is actually really common in ATE proposals, that people just kind of cut and paste from their prior proposal. So I don't think anyone actually chose this in the poll. No, no one chose this one. So I agree. I would not would not recommend doing example A. So example B really focuses on reporting activities. So it includes a lot of numbers. 150 students were enrolled, 300 students benefited, 25 faculty members, which is great. But these are really just counts of what happened. There really isn't any evidence of what happened to the students as a result of these activities. So if we look at example C, this one really answers that so what question. So what happened to all those students after they participated? What happened was their pass rates increased. They overcame challenges. This example really includes evidence of what changes were brought about because of the project. So this is an example that we would really want to aim for. So if you want to know more about what goes into the results from prior support section, we have a checklist on this topic. I know that might seem far away from right now, but it is always, I find it really helpful to think in advance. Think to, at the end of your project, what do you really hope that you can say with your evaluation? What do you really want to show as evidence of outcomes? And so, um, so even if you're just thinking about submitting your first NSF proposal, it's not too early to think about how you want to be able to talk about your accomplishments with this project in the future. So Jen is getting an idea about why evaluation is important, but she's not sure who is supposed to do this work. So we will address that question right up next. I wanna pause for another question break. So I did see a question come through. So 
Beth did say, of course, ATE recommends the consultant line for paying an independent consultant independent evaluator. Thank you for that. I think that's really helpful. I think that's typically the easiest way to go about it, um, but I've certainly seen different people go in different directions. And then Ilona asked, should the college's institutional research be engaged in the program evaluation discussions? That is a great question. I think your institutional research office can be of great value to you. However, I know that looks really different for different colleges. Some colleges have a really robust staff, and for some colleges, that's only one person, if at all. So having really um, having conversations with your institutional research office really early on in this process to really understand what kind of data do they already collect? What kind of data could they help you get um, for your evaluation in ways that take some of that burden off your external evaluation team, but also allows you to use that data for project improvement as well. So I think that they're a really important partner to get on early in those discussions. Um, but my guess would be that they wouldn't be too interested in having those nitty gritty planning discussions, like deciding on your questions or really deciding how you're going to measure those questions. But I think that they can, they're a really good partner um, to pull from as well. Questions on your mind at this point about why you should do evaluation, why you should care, or how it would help your project? While Beth types in her question, I, I will say when I first talked to Beth about doing this webinar for you all, I my oh, I immediately said yes, but I also said that I am on like a personal mission to get people excited about evaluation. So often we hear, oh, well, I just have to do it. It's a checkbox. It's something that's required or, or even some kind of anxiety about it. Um, but I, I truly believe that your evaluators are there to help you think about your project and to help you do better work. And so by going into that partnership with your evaluation team, with that lens to say, you know, how are we working together to do really great things for students or faculty or educators or the workforce? What does that partnership look like and how can you both work towards that end goal? Um, I think is a really great attitude to bring into it. So Beth asked, does Evaluate have resources for us to finding evaluators? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we are. Uh, we will talk about that a little bit more coming up, but to say the majority of people that we have asked find their evaluators through asking other people. So by saying, hey, uh, who have you worked with? Did you like working with them? What did you like about? What did you not like about it? Um, but we have an entire uh, guide that looks at how to find and select your evaluator. Um, so some sources also include, we have a map of ATE evaluators who have worked with prior projects that's hosted on ATE Central's website. Um, you can also search the American Evaluation Association database. So I would suggest uh, searching things like STEM or community college or um, cybersecurity to see if people already have experience in those areas. And then the American Evaluation Association also has local affiliate groups, which I think is a really great place to reach out to as well, especially if you're looking for someone who is more local. Um, finally, there is an organization called Expanding the Bench that has a really great database of uh, evaluators of color and evaluators who are particularly interested in doing equity work with their evaluations. Um, and again, I, I would suggest those same kind of search words of STEM or community college or STEM education to really get someone who might have experience in that area. So I saw uh, Beth put in the, the map. It should be on that AT Central site somewhere. I can look up that. It should be on the, the handout as well. Alona asked, should we include in the evaluation continuous improvement? Hmm. I would love to hear a further explanation of what that means to you. I think in so many ways, evaluation does feed into that continuous improvement for your project. Um, 
and really making sure that you're doing that in this systematic way. So for example, Evaluate is a rather large project. And so we have a lot of evaluation activities that are constantly ongoing, both internal evaluation activities and external evaluation activities. And about a year ago, our evaluation team came to us and said, look, we have all of this data. And even though you're looking at it and you're, you're using it within your decision making, we think that we can make that more um, systematic for you. I think we can, we can make this a more formal process, actually. And so they came up with this idea of bring your own data meetings. So we call them BYOD meetings. And so what happens is we, we pick an area of our work. So say, for example, webinars and our external evaluation team will bring data around webinars. And then our internal evaluation team will bring our internal data sets around webinars. And that the whole group really sits with this data. We look at it prior to the meeting. But then we come together and say, like, what's going really well and what's not going well? Um, what questions do we still have and what should we really change because of what this data is saying? And so what I have loved about these BYOD meetings is that it's baking in that continuous improvement process. We're, we're really making sure that we are critically reflecting on our evaluation findings and then action planning because of that. So Alona says, after year one, make changes based on lessons learned. So revise plan for the next year of implementation. Absolutely. So thinking about that cycle of evaluation. So you ask questions, gather data, interpret it, and then you're using that data, right? And that really then informs that cycle again. So this cycle of process improvement is inextricable from the cycle of evaluation. All right, so I'm gonna pause here. I, we will have another time for questions as well. So we talked about this a little bit, but this idea of who can conduct an evaluation. So Jen, she, she has a lot of smart people on her team. So she's wondering why they can't just do it internally. So the answer to that question is no, unfortunately you can't do it internal to your project because the ATE program solicitation does state that the evaluator must be independent of the project. So the first question we should tackle is what counts as independent? What does that really mean? Well, according to the ATE program solicitation, the evaluator may be employed by a project's home institution as long as they work in a separate unit. So like a different academic department or a different institutional research office. Um, so a separate unit. And that the, an evaluator from an outside, I'm sorry. So an evaluator from the outside of your institution and your project has the highest level of independence. So here in this graphic, you can see, so someone already employed on the project, right? So say they're a co-PI could not serve as your external evaluator. Someone within the department still can't serve as your external evaluator because they're just not separate enough. But someone in a different college or in a completely different unit or out there in the big wide world, not at your institution at all, um, can serve as your external evaluator. There's one more note here to say that if someone is external to your institution entirely, but they're being paid by the project in another manner, so say they are doing work for the project, they're developing educational curriculum, even though they're not at your institution, they would not be able to serve as an external evaluator because they, they just don't serve that sense of um, like critical accountability enough. So believe it or not, evaluation really is a unique profession and discipline. So we have our own professional associations, our own scholarships and academic journals, and a whole lot of professionals who identify as evaluators. So I mentioned the American Evaluation Association it has something like six or 7,000 members. So when looking for an evaluator, it's really important to know that there's not one specific degree or certi certification that is required to call yourself an evaluator. So pretty much anyone can put out a sign and say they're an evaluator. Um, so big consultant firms can say evaluation is one of the services they offer. And neither of those things really ensures that that person is qualified. So you wanna be really careful to look for someone who has experience as an evaluator, 
someone who has those strong research or data collection analysis skills, someone who is a good communicator and will be responsive to your situation. And it can also be helpful for someone to have an understanding of the NSF or two-year college context. So it's not always easy to find someone with the perfect mix of credentials. I think the important part is finding someone that you feel like clicks with you in your project. So let's help Jen select an evaluator for her project. So take a moment to review the credentials of these three evaluators. Um, and then I think I was going to do a poll, but I don't think it's there. So in, in, in the chat box, um, suggest your recommendation about which evaluator Jen should choose for her project and why. And then maybe even if you have reservations about certain evaluators or suggestions, you can use the chat box to explain some of your concerns. So when you read these short evaluator descriptions, use the chat box to say, which evaluator would you recommend Jen choose? So we have some votes for B. We have lots of votes for B. That's the one thing about doing it in the chat instead of a poll is that it's not exactly, uh, there's some peer pressure there. <laughs> Well, let's take a look at each of these evaluators more closely. So sometimes it can be kind of difficult to tell whether or not they're a good fit from their resume alone. You might really need some follow-up questions. So having that conversation or a phone call with them can really help. But let's look, let's look at what we have here. So evaluator A seems to have good knowledge of two-year colleges, technical education, and student services. So I would want to know more about their experience in external evaluation of grant funded projects. So accreditation is mentioned and it has a lot in common with the program evaluation, but it's not the same thing. Evaluator B looks like they have really great credentials when it comes to evaluation, but I would wanna know how much time they would really have to work on this project, given that they're working with 25 other evaluations. And I would suspect that they have a team working with them. So I would also want to know who would actually be working on this project and what the credentials of that person is, not just the larger organization. Evaluator C certainly knows two-year colleges and NSF, but it's not clear if they would have any expertise when it comes to the research methods or running of evaluations. So I would really make sure to ask and follow up about those things. Yeah, I like that uh, in the comments, Craig says B because evaluators NSF project X, 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 X. <laughs> I really am slipping over my words today. And then Beth noted, I would interview C next. So like I said before, we do have this guide to finding and selecting an evaluator up on our website. Um, and so that will have the, the link to the evaluator map that Beth had put in the chat as well as some questions of what you should ask evaluators when you're meeting with them to really help determine the fit of them to your project. Um, so this is really all about that external independent evaluator, but there are certainly some evaluation efforts that you could do internally. So let's look at kind of the responsibility breakdown between the external evaluator and the project team. So while the evaluator should be responsible for the more technical aspects of the evaluation, things like data collection, analysis, reporting, the project team really is in the best position to keep track of who is involved in what the project is doing. And then the project team and the evaluator can work together to plan the evaluation, collect data, and interpret results. And this isn't uh, just about 
cost cutting, but it's really about making the evaluation something that's feasible and relevant to all the key stakeholders. So mo some of the most productive evaluations have a really strong collaborative relationship between the project team and the external evaluation team. So back to our friend Jen, she's warming up to this idea of having her project evaluated, but she's not clear on how it's supposed to show up in her proposal. So let's take a look at that. She knows that she should check the NSF's proposal and award policies and procedures guide, the uh, known PP, PAPPG, <laughs> as it's typically known, but it doesn't provide any guidance on how to address the project's external evaluation. So as you work on your proposals, I really encourage you to think of them as a jigsaw puzzle. So each piece of your proposal needs to fit with the other pieces to convey an overall coherent picture of what you'll be doing with the grant funds, why that's important, and what will happen because of those funds. So there are, uh, there are certain required elements of an NSF proposal. So the check marks here indicate the parts where you should have information related to evaluation integrated. So we're not gonna get into the details of all these sections today. Rather, we're gonna really hone in on this project description. So the project description is the main part of an NSF proposal, and it can be up to 15 pages long. So the content that I have listed here are based on guidance from the ATE program solicitation. The sections of the program description where you will definitely need information about your evaluation are the results from prior support section. So again, this is if you have been funded before, as we've discussed, and of course the evaluation plan. So of the 15 page project description, about one to three pages should be dedicated for evaluation. I typically suggest about a page and a half, unless you have really good reasons for that to be longer or for that to be shorter. So in this small space, you should identify your evaluator, what the evaluation questions will be, what the data will be collected and how it will be used to answer the evaluation questions, what types of evaluation reports or other deliverables will be prepared and when. So I know this is, this is a lot. This is actually a webinar in and of itself. Um, we also have, we have a prior webinar and video series recordings that really go into detail on each of these sections. So as you get to that step, um, when you're ready to write your evaluation plan, I hope that you come back and, and watch those videos. So in the meantime, there is a lot of information about how to build evaluation into your proposal in our comprehensive ATE evaluation planning checklist. So this checklist is a really great resource um, that will go over all of the different elements that you need to prepare for and get ready for your proposal. And then we also have specific guidance on how to organize the evaluation section. So we actually have an evaluation plan template that would be helpful as well. So hopefully we are taking some of the mystery uh, out of evaluation, uh, but this has all been about what happens before your project gets funded. So you might still be wondering about what happens after you get your grant. So I just wanna take a, a minute to touch on that to give you a sense of what that looks like. So generally speaking, each year of your grant, the evaluation will go through a cycle of data collection, analysis, and reporting. And then of course, using the evaluation to make adjustments as needed in your work for the next year. So in year one, uh, more time is needed to dedicate to planning the evaluation. And it's a good idea to meet with your evaluator in person during this phase, if that's possible. So this will involve establishing formal agreements between the evaluator and the project. Then the evaluator will work with you to develop an actionable evaluation plan because that page and a half that was in your proposal um, isn't quite enough to carry out all of the evaluation work and really set things into motion. So there is also a time to establish a relationship with the college's institutional research office, which is what we talked about before, and to find out what data they'll really be able to provide and how you can best work with them. Most likely some data collection instruments and protocols will also need to be developed and tested, and that can happen during this planning phase as well. So after that preliminary data, after that preliminary data collection can begin for that first year. So that first year looks a bit different depending on how much time uh, you had taken up for that planning section. 
And then the first evaluation report will need to be delivered in advance of the project's first annual report to the NSF. So that's a pretty quick turnaround. So that's why I'm saying that first evaluation report may not be as robust as you hope it to be. Um, but hopefully once you get the planning in year ones, year two and three can go from there. So then this data collection analysis and reporting cycle can really repeat itself annually with periodic meetings and meetings and ongoing communication between the project team and the evaluation team. So I will say to get a really good plan in place for working with your evaluator, we have a communication plan checklist for ATPIs and evaluators. So when evaluations go wrong, it's, I often see it's due to just poor communication or misunderstandings between the evaluator and the project team. So this checklist can really help make sure that you start your work off on a good foot. All right, so Jen is feeling pretty good about having her project evaluated. So I hope you are too. So we do have our last question break coming up. So if you have any lingering questions or elements you want to discuss further, please go ahead and put that in the chat. Um, and again, the recording of this webinar will be available to you as well. So I know I saw some questions come through. Oh, you call it uh, a PAPG instead of a PAPBG? I would like that acronym way better because I always trip over when I say PAPBG. <laughs> So Ilona asked, prior results for all NSF projects awarded to the institution or to the proposed PI? So it is to the proposed PI, um, so PIs or co-PIs that are on that project, if they have received prior NSF support, need to fill out that section, not the, the overall institution. Beth, thank you for putting the link to the evaluation plan. I normally have someone on with me who can put in all of these links as I say them out loud, but uh, she was unavailable today. So I really appreciate your, your help in doing that. Oh, did the link come up unvalid? My computer is trying to, oh, it does. I will fix that right now. That's sad. Uh, so Beth said, prior results from any project in the past five years to all of the principal investigators. You could include results for closely related projects if showing expertise and experience for this project. Yeah, and I think always going back to putting yourself in the shoes of reviewers to say, what kinds of information would justify whether or not your team was adequately prepared to do this work? And if that helps make that justification, if that helps make that argument, um, thinking about how you could include it. Um, so let, I'm gonna find the evaluation plan template and give you the correct link. What other questions are you left with? What are you thinking about? What do you feel like is still uh, holding you back? So I'm gonna drop a link in here. So we have a, what we call a toolkit for proposal development. And it has, it should have all of the updated links for everything. And the second link on there is the evaluation plan template, which I will also put in the chat. Thank you, Alona. I understand if people have to log off, it is top of the hour. Um, 205 here in Michigan, but I can certainly hang around a little bit longer to answer questions. So Beth asks, when should we find an evaluator? So I, I recently have asked a number of AT evaluators this exact question, like when do you want to be brought on board? And their initial answer is as soon as possible, to which I say, okay, well, there is some, something as too soon, right? And so I said, what do you want project staff to come prepared with. And so their, their big things was having a sense of the intended outcome. So, and by that, they don't mean like the individual indicators or criteria or measurements of what that is, 
but a big sense of what are you trying to work towards? What is the end impact? Um, a vision statement of this is what I want to look differently in three years because of my project. This is what I want to look differently in five years because of my project. And then a basic understanding of what those activities are to get there. I don't think you need to know all of the connections, but I think that basic building blocks of what are you going to do to bring about what kind of change? And I think that those are the two major things that they, at like once you have that in place, once you have that core idea of what your proposal is, they can really help you move on from there. So I do want to mention that I, I said some institutions won't allow you to work with an evaluator prior to being funded. And so something that Evaluate has started up in the last year or so is the ability for project staff to work with an evaluation coach. So we have three evaluation coaches. Um, they are all lovely and wonderful to work with. And they all have experience in ATE evaluations or STEM education evaluations. And so what they are there for is to serve as that uh, sounding board. If you have questions or say you end up in a place where you have to write your evaluation plan by yourself and you don't have that external evaluation team on board, you can actually work with them um, to develop that. So they won't develop it for you, but what they will do is they can uh, ask questions to get at that what you're looking to do. They can help walk you through that evaluation plan checklist in writing the different sections, and they can review your final evaluation plan to say, yes, this makes sense, or no, this part needs a little bit uh, more details in there. Um, so I will put that link to more information about the evaluation coaching in the chat. But if you find yourself at any point where you can't find an evaluator or aren't sure where to look for an evaluator um, or just really need some evaluation help um, and assistance specific to your proposal and your context, uh, coaching is absolutely a great resource that we have available. And of course, I should say I'm also always available. So my email is up on the website and so you can email me directly or you can give me a call as well. Um, I would welcome any of that. Yes, so Blake notes that some institutions will allow a pre-award bid process to secure the evaluator in advance and naming them in your submission. So there is this ideal situation in which you can get an evaluator on board now or last month even, right? And I think that that would be great, especially because then you can write their names and their specific credentials into your proposal, which I think is a really strong justification for NSF reviewers to say, Yes, they are set up for success in this evaluation. I just recognize that not all institutions have that capacity. So kind of have two different paths available to you. Well, I am still around for a few minutes, but I do want to say thank you all. Um, I always love talking about evaluation for sure. Um, I do have a, a quick follow-up survey just to learn what went well about this webinar, what could be improved. 